thank you so much for inviting me and for the wonderful hospitality. I would also like to thank uh, you know the, the hospitality. The stay has been excellent. I'd like to thank two other people also. One is my advisor, David Schmoyes. I'm delighted he's here. You know, his own work on LP rounding as well as his mentoring has truly meant a great deal to me. And the second person is Joseph Cherian. He taught my first real course on randomized algorithms, and the influence of both of these people has been tremendous. Thank you. So, um, so w what I'd really like to point out is that th there was this breakthrough by Moser and Tardoshin <coughs> in 2009 on an algorithmic version of the, of the Lovas local lemma. But what's really turned out is that the MT, the moser tardosh process, really should be thought of as a stochastic process of its own independent interest. It goes, in fact, much beyond the local lemma. That's what our understanding has, has evolved to over the last few years. And I'd like to convince you of some of these applications in, in rounding. Um, so these are from two joint works. One is with my student, David Harris. Um, and this was from 2013. And the other is in the upcoming SODA with uh, Harris and a high school student, Antares Chen, who worked with us. He's, he started at Berkeley now as an undergrad. Um, so, uh, so before you know, introducing the moser tardosh process, let me say what the main applications are, what the main results are that we get uh, in this context. Uh, I'd like to speak about two families of uh, integer programming problems and come up with good uh, rounding schemes for the natural LP relaxation. One, of course, is covering. But I'd also like to think about multi-criteria covering problems. So let's say you're given a fractional solution with uh, some R uh, linear objectives such that um, and furthermore, you have the usual covering constraints. So. So suppose you have um, a feasible fractional solution to this, and you want to round it. You may also think about additional constraints, such as bounds on the variables and so on. So the key sort of uh, you know, takeoff point from Vicious talk is, so, so by the way, we'll always normalize this matrix A so, it's, so that uh, the entries lie between 0 and 1. So Vicious talk mainly focused on uh, the maximum number of non-zeros in any problem. So let uh, so the following two parameters would be uh, you know so delta is the maximum L zero norm of any column in any column and um, column of A and delta one is the max L one norm. So and of course delta one is always less than or equal to delta zero. Um, so I'd like to show that you know this can be done using the moser tardosh procedure, in fact, uh, with almost no reference to the local lemma. And furthermore, what's to me really interesting is that you get such good you know, um, sort of uh, correlations between the different variables at the end of the moser tardosh procedure that you can also handle multiple objectives almost uh, seamlessly. This is one family that we look at. The other is assignment packing, again, something that essentially Wish uh, referred to. Assignment packing is you have addition, you have a packing problem, but with additional disjoint uh, assignment <coughs> constraints that come up in say packet ro packet routing, job uh, uh, scheduling, and so on. So let's call this uh, assignment packing. So you have uh, as you sh now you have packing constraints, but now the variables are supported on disjoint assignment uh, variables. So for example, let's say you have And so on. So, in other words, you have. So, notice that these are all disjoint sets of variables, right? So, I've written them like this. Uh, so, and this, of course, again comes up a lot. For example, these could be, uh, each of these could be an SITI pair in a graph, right? So, this could be S1, this could correspond to S1, T1, this could correspond to S2, T2, and so on. And each row here could correspond to an edge, and these could be congestion constraints. So, and these could be so. So, each of uh, these possible choices, one, two, three, up to five, could be potential S1, T1 paths, right? And uh, you want to choose exactly one for every packet, 
subject to some congestion constraints. Or you can think of this as, a, uh, as, a, as an assignment problem. Each of these is a job. Each uh, row here corresponds to a job. Each job has to be assigned to a machine. And uh, this could be each constraint here could, could refer to a machine. And you want the load on the machine to be small. Right? So, so these are the two um, families of problems we look at. And the main takeaway is essentially as compared to randomized rounding or other theorems like Karp et al. that I'll, I'll recall for you, you can essentially sort of replace the number of constraints here by the L1 norm of uh, any column of, uh, of A. Okay. So, and furthermore, like I said, there is some interesting stuff in multi-criteria problems that I'll mention. So, so what is known here? As Vish pointed out, one standard thing you could do is just standard independent randomized rounding. So solve the LP. And in this case, you will multiply all these variables by some scale factor alpha greater than 1 in order to boost the probability of, uh, you know, of satisfying these. And then just round the variables independently. And then argue uh, by a churn off that uh, you know, none of these is violated with, with much probability. And then just do a union bound over all of these. Right? So that's the standard approach. And in this case, you view each of those rows as a distribution. And independently for every one of these rows, so for example, for the first index 1, pick one of these five at random, uh, guided by this as your probability distribution, and independently for all of these. And once again, you, know, you, you get uh, you know, a sum of independent random variables here. And how much should the violation be here additively, uh, so that uh, you know, by turn off, if there are m constraints here, the probability of violation of any one of them is, say, at most 1 over 2m and just do a union bound. Right? So these are the standard bounds, standard approaches. What do they give you? So for simplicity, let me just assume that uh, r is equal to 1 for now. So again, there are m constraints. Then roughly speaking, what you get, uh, let me apologize for a piece of notation. I'll have to let uppercase b be the smallest element of, of lowercase b. Okay? So please bear with this uh, uh, strange notation. So uh, we can assume without loss of generality that it's greater than or equal to 1. Roughly speaking, what one needs to do is to choose alpha, the scale factor here, by which to scale all these uh, xj to be something like this. In standard randomized rounding. Actually, I had some improvement using the fkg inequality, but it's a little technical. So approximately, let's take this to be this. And in this case, if we do independent rounding, uh, essentially the B, the BI, will instead become in the i row the violation would be the original BI plus roughly something like this. Again, this can be you know improved a little bit, but let's not worry about it. It's essentially something like this if you have, if you use the standard churn of root, right? So this is what uh, this gives you. But on the other hand, there's a whole wealth of work on rounding columns, uh, column sparse LPs, uh, LPs and IPs. So starting with, for example, the famous Beck-Fiala theorem, and uh, a close relative of which is the Karp et al. theorem that uh, Wish alluded to. Right? So, so what would those give? So I'll mention some now and, and some further later. So, but what does column sparsity give you? Can you see this behind? Okay. What would column sparsity give you here? In this case, for example, this would give you something interesting. It would give you the Karp et al. theorem. So this can be viewed as a different proof of the length thresh moist Ardoche and moist Ardoche results. Uh, 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 Karp, uh, Leighton et al., Rivers, Thompson, Vazirani, and Vazirani would give you bi. So the, the right-hand side will become strictly smaller than bi plus delta 1, where delta 1 is the maximum L1 norm of any column of this. Right? So this is what, so, so again, these two are incomparable. But one question we are going to ask is, can we interpolate between these two? Right? So that, that's one of the main questions we are going to ask. So in particular, for example, in, in the packet routing context, if these are congestion constraints, then, and furthermore, if every packet i uh, needs a bandwidth of, uh, say, a di on every edge it passes through, then the column sparsity delta 1 is basically the maximum over all packets i 
of di times the length of the corresponding path. Right? So if you're routing along short paths, for example, you want much better uh, bounds than just uh, you know this naive union bound based definition. Right? So so that's what we are we are rooting for. That's true. In Schmoistardosh, you know, all of these are, say, at most some t, and you want to prove that, say, let's say it's at most two t. Um, this thing? Oh, these two coincide in, in length threshold and time. Because, in fact, in A, in any column, there is only one norm here. So all the norms, all the LP norms are the same. Because what will happen is, you will have variables x, i, j, right? Yeah. <coughs> okay. So this is okay. So this is generally speaking, you know, what Chernoff gives, and uh, you know, column sparsity, uh, you know, has been fairly well studied, starting with Beckfiela and the carpet all the sort of independent carpet all paper. Uh, also, uh, Nikhil, Vish, uh, Nitish Karula, and I had a paper on column sparsity for uh, packing problems where we showed that delta 1 parameterization by delta 1 is not possible, but we showed that we can parameterize by delta 0. Of course, packing problems are much harder because, you know, the constraints are very stringent, but in covering one can hope to do better, right? So also, there is classical work of Dobson and Fisher and Wolsey uh, on the greedy algorithm for covering problems, which in fact is sensitive to the to the maximum L1 norm of any column in A. I'll, I'll show you the, the, the precise result. So, you know, so this is the sort of problem we want to see. And I myself did some earlier work, but that was all parameterized by delta 0, which I'll mention. Right? So this is the background. And so essentially what we want is to replace, so to this M by delta 1, right? So that's the goal. Okay? So in all of these, can you replace the M by delta 1 is the goal. And, but there are, like I said, there are some additional bonuses one gets, like being able to handle multiple objectives seamlessly. Okay? And all of these come, through, come about by sort of reinterpreting the moser tardosh algorithm in a, in a manner that has nothing to do essentially with the local lemma, um, you know, so in retrospect. Okay. So let me mention what results we get are, uh, what the results are. So, so please keep in mind that this matrix, all these matrices have entr entries between 0 and 1, and delta 0 and delta 1 are these, right? So in fact, Dobson and Fisher and Wolsey, okay, so, so they get, you know, it's, uh, you know so they, they, they look at the greedy algorithm, so with one objective. So of course, since you're looking at greedy algorithms, uh, you, you're looking at one objective, and they also have integer data. So it's a little incomparable with our framework, but roughly speaking, what uh, uh, Dobson, so this is from 1982. For covering problems with one objective, they show that the greedy algorithm <coughs> actually gets an approximation of essentially something like this. Um, so let me just add this one in case delta one is very small. They get something like this. Uh, so Fisher and Wolsey is also is uh, sensitive to the, it also takes the objective function into account. So I'm, I'm not doing that. So, so roughly speaking, so this is not exactly the statement, but uh, uh, this is a, is a rough approximation to what they get because to, to say the full, full statement, I have to talk about the objective function also, right? So what we are able to show are the following. Um, so it's just like greedy set over. So now you could either have this constraint or unrestricted uh, integrality. So take the you know you know add the variable which uh, brings most bang for the buck. I see, I see. So which uh, uh -uh. so so how do you define the greedy heuristic? Because you know setting a variable may not immediately you know you, you, yeah especially if there are upper bounds you, it may not. But let's say I, I forget what the strategy I should ask. Uh, from 1982. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't recall the exact greedy heuristic, but I think it's a natural heuristic. I forget. Maybe the um, maybe the the total progress it makes across all the constraints divided by its cost or something. Right. So these are the known results. What we get are the following. So this is from this upcoming Soda paper. So what we get are so these are the known results, and this is 
on the on the other hand what follows from uh, uh, from standard randomized rounding so we get the following this parameter gamma will be useful so gamma let's say is log of 1 plus delta 1 now the b is outside okay so what we get are these we get uh, an approximation that is essentially 1 plus gamma plus 4 square root gamma okay so basically uh, you know, it is uh, instead of the B being inside, the B comes outside and remember that B is greater than or equal to 1, right. And furthermore, this is tight, this constant is tight for the integrality gap, not just for set cover, but for every choice of gamma. And also, the problem is inapproximable, inapproximable say to within 1 plus 0.9 times gamma. And the runtime is, is essentially linear, right. But the interesting thing is, what if you have you know, multiple constraints, then greedy, you know, greedy is undefined, right. So, what one can essentially show that, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, if you call this beta, then all of these get scaled by beta, right. So, then this, uh, this becomes d i plus, uh, so it gets scaled by beta plus O square root of beta d i, d i log r basically. So, one can handle multiple constraints seamlessly this manner, okay. Um, this is one thing and a final point to make is this is when um, you know this is when the variables are unrestricted, right. If there are bounds on these you know these rounding algorithms become a little harder because if you scale this up it may exceed this bound, right. So, that is a somewhat non-trivial problem. Neil Young and uh, Stavros Koliopoulos worked on that uh, aspect. So, suppose you are allowed to uh, violate these by 1 plus epsilon, right. So, Koliopoulos and Young showed that if you can violate these by 1 plus epsilon, they showed that uh, you can approximate the problem to within something like this log delta 0 divided b by b epsilon squared. We are able to do better than that. First of all, you do not need the quadratic dependence on epsilon, only linear dependence. And uh, uh, once again, this delta 0 can be replaced by delta 1. Okay. So, these are the results for, uh, for covering. For assignment packing, there is a variety of results, but the simplest to state is the following is instead of either this or this, one gets for any constant you like for all C there exists C prime such that you can get B i plus B i over delta 1 to the C. You can make this any, any, any large constant you want, but you have to pay a price here something like this. And my earlier work with Tom Layton and Satish Rao and Lincoln Lu had delta 0 instead of delta 1. So, these are some of the results. Um, do I want to mention anything else about uh, the results right now? Yeah. Um, okay. So, so let's see some of the applications. So, this is the general statement. I'd like to point out two applications here, concrete applications that are of interest that don't have anything to do with this specific statement. And these, I think, are interesting. And one has a very interesting open problem. So, two applications. One is the famous Leighton, Mags, and Rao theorem. Um, so, Leighton, Mags and Rao had this amazing package scheduling result in the late 1980s that says the following. So, suppose you have a package scheduling, not a packet routing problem. So, what do I mean by that? So, you have a graph and you are given um, some package to root, but you are also given the routing path for each of these. Okay? So, you are given k packets as well as a routing path for each of these and you just want to schedule the movement of these packets along their respective given paths, right, subject to the constraint that, you know, every edge traversal takes one unit of time, let us say time is discrete and the vertices or edges can queue packets and edge can only take one packet at a time, let us say, right. So, how, how will you schedule in order to minimize the make span? So, Leighton Max Rao was scheduling to minimize make span 
make span is the latency or the time by which the last packet uh, uh, reaches its destination. Right? And they showed the following really, uh, you know, they had this very seminal uh, paper that shows the following. Right? So notice that there are two simple lower bounds on the, on the latency. If this path is length 120, then any schedule will take at least 120 steps, right? So on the one hand, so the latency or make span is at least D, the length of the longest routing path, routing path PI. And at the same time, it's also greater than or equal to the congestion. This is called the dilation in routing literature. The congestion is, if among these paths, there is some edge that takes 50 of these paths, right? then just for that edge to process all its paths one by one will take you 50 time steps. So if C is the maximum congestion of this collection of paths, right, the maximum load that they impose on any edge, that's also a load bound. Therefore, the make span M is greater than or equal to, for example, this. And their amazing result was that, in fact, M is always less than or equal to O of C plus D. This constant was very, very large, uh, maybe 10 to the 8 or so initially. It's, it's gradually come down. So one application of our research is we are able to show that this is true with a reasonable constant, 5.7 times C plus D. So it's come down a fair bit. But you know, uh, uh, Thomas Rothwas has a lower bound that shows that this cannot be decreased below 1. Notice that here you get a half. Uh, he has shown that some 1 plus epsilon is necessary here. Uh, it would be interesting to see what the right constant is. Here is another application, which is, I think, very well known in the uh, combinatorics community, but mu much less in computer science, and this is the following. Um, it's, a, it's a really, it's a result for which the optimal bound is known non-constructively, and uh, the corresponding algorithmic uh, thing is not known. There is no efficient algorithm to construct um, you know, the structure, and what is it? Consider the following problem. It was introduced by Erdős, Bolabash, and Semridi. Okay, so this is one application. The second is, they introduced these transversal problems, which are the following. So you have an undirected graph, and an adversary has partitioned, so, so this is due, to, yeah, so originally due to Erdős et al., uh, Bolabash et al., so an adversary has partitioned your vertices, and the only constraint on the adversary is that every, uh, every one of the blocks of the partition should be of size at least b. Okay. Right. And what you want is, so you give the adversary your graph, the adversary partitions into, let's say, blocks of size exactly b, and you want to find a transversal. A transversal is a choice of one vertex from every block, and recall that this is a partition, such that uh, you know this is an independent, right? So the question is, what is the so so now parameterized by the maximum degree delta of the graph? What is the maximum? What is the minimum b such that as long as you as long as you know that every block has size at least b, regardless of how the adversary you know partitions the vertices, you can always find an independent set that hits every block, right? So there is also a story here. Uh, so Noga alone, uh, using the local lemma, he showed that B equals 2E delta suffices. So this is like 5.4 delta, right? So what does this mean? This means the following, right? So you know that if the max degree is delta, then there exists an independent set of size at least this much, right? Now what you, uh, what we are saying is if in this constant one here, if we, if we are willing to take a loss of 5.4 through E, then not just is there an independent set of size N over 5.4 delta, because each block is of size B, the number of, uh, number of blocks is N over B, but you know, with a lot of structure, independent sets with a lot of structure, which is um, uh, you know, hitting, you know, hit, hitting every one of your blocks, basically. Right? So Alon showed this, and uh, here is where the story comes. So, so we improved it to 4 delta, and I was very happy you improved the result of Noah Gallon. So you're very happy, right? So we started out with this. Um, we started out with uh, B equal to 4 delta suffices. 
And I was going to speak about this at Alan Fries' 60th birthday conference, so of which Ravi was one of the organizers. So, uh, so and Jeff Kahn and I were walking to the uh, to, to the conference center, and I told Jeff very happily about this. And Jeff politely pointed out that Penny Haxel actually had the optimal result already, and that is two delta. Okay. So, uh, so in other words, b b equals two delta suffices, and there exist graphs for which uh, uh, instances for which two delta minus one doesn't suffice. So two delta is really the truth, okay? But Jeff was kind enough to add that on the day of his PhD defense, some professor also told him that a good part of his, of his uh, a good part or small part of his thesis was already known. Okay, so Jeff was kind enough to point that out to me. Okay, so so here is the interesting open question. So Haxel, right? And I'll show you what our cont contribution is in a minute. It's not not this. This is now you know we know Haxel does better. We, we show optimal or asymptotically optimal bounds for a related problem. I'll come to in a minute. But here is the very interesting open question. And b equals 2 delta, and this is best possible. But there are two proofs of this result, and both are non-constructive. One is combinatorial, one uses combinatorial topology. Both are non-constructive. A very interesting open question is, so once again, you are given a graph of max degree delta. And you're given a partition of the vertices in an arbitrary manner into blocks of size 2 delta. Uh, efficiently find an independent set in the graph that hits every one of these blocks. Okay? It's a very interesting open question. Like I said, you know, these, I think, are less known in the computer science and optimization communities. I mean, this comes up as a primitive in various graph partitioning uh, sort of things in, in combinatorics. So, so, so here is our contribution. So this was already known, so that's not a big deal. But, uh, you know, I think Erdes Bolabash et al. also asked the following question. So suppose you want to find a transversal, once again, a choice of one vertex from each block that doesn't lead to any clique of, of size s or more, right? So the independent set problem corresponds to s equals to 2, right? So what happens if, you know, what should this bound be? It'll obviously come down. What should this bound be as a function of s, right? So that if every block is of size at least b, you're guaranteed to find a transversal that avoids any clique of size s. And here is where uh, our contribution is. So Sabo and Tardosh, the same Gabber Tardosh, um, they looked at this problem. So Sabo and Tardosh, they show that b has to be at least uh, something like this. L let me not worry about the lower order term. The lower order term goes to 0 with s. This is just a function of s, like 1 over s. O on the other hand, low and pseudo this is portion low, low and, low and pseudo show that uh, v less than or equal to 2 delta over s times 1 plus little o of 1 suffices. Right? So what we are able to show is, in fact, that this lower bound is asymptotically correct. In other words, what we what we give is not just an existence result, but also uh, a polynomial time algorithm, which, for a sufficiently large little o of one, this is like one over square root s, I think. Uh, if you are given a, a, a graph with blocks of this size, will find in random polynomial time um, a transversal that avoids any clique of size. Okay, so so. Pardon. The little o is enough. Yeah, yeah, the, the little low is enough. Yeah. So in fact, if you if you are interested, Sabo and Tardosh also make an exact conjecture. Their conjecture is, in fact, that uh, their conjecture here is uh, that uh, in fact the correct B is delta uh, times S over S minus one the whole square. If S is equal to two, this is two delta. I mean the point this is their lower bound actually. So their little o of one is of the order of one over s, right? So, so this, this is one contribution we make. There are various other applications also which I'll skip, right? So, but the unifying thread behind all of these. So, um, so once again going back to this, the idea is uh, really just the L1 norm of any column that matters, and all these results are best possible in terms of integrality gaps. Right? So uh, how do we prove these? Right? So this is where Moser-Tardogen enters. 
and where we, we really require nothing about the local lemma. So, so let me recall the Mohsa Tadosh algorithm in extremely easy to describe algorithm, right. So let me for example say, start with in the context of KSAT, right. So consider, you know, you can think of it as a heuristic algorithm which may work well in practice also, but for KSAT under certain conditions it will provide a satisfying assignment, right. So, so suppose you have a KSAT formula where let's say I, I say that by KSAT I mean exactly K, every, every class is exactly k literals, right. So k equal to 5, let us say, right. So suppose you have a KSAT formula, right. So um, and uh, so here is what Moser Tadush will do. Uh, let us start with an initial distribution. Let us say, um, uh, let us say the distribution for variable xj, the, pro the probability that uh, xj is 1 is let us say half, right. So this could have been a different, it could have been a biased distribution which also makes sense in some cases. but let us say you, you have this. So independently sample uh, all the variables from their distributions, independently sample all xj, all the variables. And while there exists a violated clause, pick any one such arbitrarily, say, CI and resample the variables in CI. Resample by that we mean independently sample them again using the same distribution. That's it. The variables in CI. This is the Moser Tardosh algorithm. More generally, the recipe is simply this. Suppose you have some independent random variables, right? And you have various bad events. The bad event in, in the case of KSAT is that for, a, for uh, this particular clause is unsatisfied by the, by, the, by the assignment. So more generally, suppose you have some bad events, each of which is a function of some subset of the variables, initially set everybody at random, right, yeah, do an initial sampling. And while one of these bad events is still true, suppose it depends on these five variables, pick any one such and just resample its variables, that's it, right. This is all the recipe is. And uh, so, so like I said, this essentially gave algorithmic versions of the, the local lemma in almost all cases, but you can look at this as a, as a recipe of independent inting. Right? Uh, so for example, coming back to, so, so let us in fact uh, talk about how you would tailor this to something like a covering type uh, linear program, integer program, right. So one thing you could do is you could start with the LP, scale everything by some appropriate alpha, right, whatever alpha you are interested in or such a beta, right, and then independently around the variables. And while uh, there exists, and let us say there is just one objective, right, while there exists uh, a violated constraint, just resample its variables, right. But, you know, if you look at the structure of covering, that does not make sense, right. So, for, you know, so since all these constraints are monotone, right, if many of these guys, so let us say the variables are just constrained to be 0, 1. If many of these guys are 1, it does not make sense to resample them, right. It is the ones that are 0 that you want to resample, right. So this is the reason I said that Moser Tardosh really is a framework from which one can really uh, go off in many different directions. And if you are interested, I highly recommend my student David Harris's PhD thesis, which uh, was just submitted recently. He has a whole host of results on the, on the, on the problem, and I have had the pleasure of uh, participating in some of them. Um, so. So let us actually come up with the following algorithm, let us say, right. What about the following um, iterative algorithm motivated by, and in fact I can give you, a, you know, a reasonable amount of the analysis as well. Once again motivated by the Moser Tardosh analysis. So what if we do the following? So we initially scale all the variables by some appropriate alpha, right, and, and, uh, and round the variables independently. Scale them up by alpha and round them independently, right. So by appropriate alpha, the alpha would really be this beta. So, you know, so, so for some alpha, so here is the proof idea. So, So for all j independently, xj 
is a Bernoulli. Let, let's assume that all the, so, so you start with the LP solution. Let's assume that the LP solution uh, X is small enough that even when you uh, scale by alpha, this is uh, uh, less than or equal to one. As you know, the extremal cases for integrality gaps are when these variables are infinitesimally small, so that's okay. So in other words, so scale up your LP solution by alpha and round independently, right? So, but now let's change this in the following way. So let's look at, so don't worry about the constraints now. Uh, I'm sorry, don't worry about the objectives now. Just look at these constraints and satisfy them one by one, okay? So for i running from one to m, right? We'll sequentially satisfy all of them. For i running from one to m, while this constraint is not satisfied, try to gradually satisfy it, motivated by resampling. While um, axi is less than bi, what we are going to do is look at all the variables for j running from one to n. If xj is still zero, so let's assume that this is a zero one problem. If xj is still zero, then xj, but now you, you slow down the rate at which, uh, the rate at which you, you increase these to one. Initially, you, you set it to one with, with a fairly high probability. Now you won't scale it by alpha, but by a smaller quantity. In particular, make it sensitive to aij, alpha sigma xj, where sigma will be smaller than one, okay? This is all the algorithm. So alpha is bigger than one. So alpha sigma will be, will be um, could be greater or smaller than one. And in particular, if this variable, if this aij is not too large, you, you're not going to nudge this variable too much, right? So this is all the algorithm. So sequentially satisfy the constraints. And um, you know, uh, do nothing to, I mean, of course, if somebody is already one, you're happy. Otherwise, give it, give it a nudge, right? And keep keep repeating this until uh, you know uh, you know until the constraint gets satisfied, and then move on to the next constraint. This is all the algorithm, right? Clearly, as long as these parameters are reasonable, you know, as long as say you know, I mean, this will eventually, of course, satisfy all the constraints, right? Now we have to analyze how large the final XJs are so that the uh, objective functions are small. But at, it is at this point that we also get a bonus, which which I'll come to. Just which is that we can also talk about the joint distribution of multiple variables and so on seamlessly, right? In fact, this brings me to the next sort of power of Moser Tadros, which is that it has so much randomness even at the end that you can reason about, you know, you can reason about how the variables look even conditioning on Moser Tadros having terminated. In particular, for example, one of the things, so you know, this, this particular stuff appears in an upcoming SODA paper. We have a different SODA paper that also shows, in particular, that mo if you implement Moser Tadosh, it, it, in fact, the number of possible satisfying assignments, if you have a KSAT formula uh, that satisfies the local MR conditions, is actually ex is quite large, actually. So one can show just using this kind of Moser Tadosh type ideas that, in fact, you, you can give a lower bound on the number of satisfying assignments of any KSAT formula also. Right? So, okay, so, so this is the algorithm. Now we have to argue about what the expected value, what is, so take, so let's do, just do, right now let's just do a single variable at a time. What is the probability that, we want an upper bound on the probability that xj is equal to one at the end, right? right? For this, the idea suggested by Moser Tadosh is witness trees, something called witness trees. We actually require something much simpler because this is a much, uh, much more, you know, very restricted context. So l l let me give you at least half of the truth, okay? So the question is, what is the probability that xj is equal to one at the end, right? So for this, what we are going to do is, we are going to construct some witness trees that witness the fact that xj is equal to one at the end. These are in fact witness lists, not even witness trees. And so basically, uh, so we we are, and then so so if x j is equal to one, it will be witnessed by either this structure tau one or tau two and so on. We're going to list 
a potentially uh, infinitely many uh, 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 potentially infinitely large sequence, right? Uh, and therefore, the by the union bound, the probability that xj is one is less than or equal to the sum of all these structures of the probability of tau. So all we need to do is to say how we construct these, bound the probability of any one of them, and show that their sum is not too too large. Right? Right? So let's see a witness. So so how do we construct a witness for at the end of this process that xj is equal to one? Right? So <coughs> let's actually do the following. We we will equivalently think of this the following instead of this let's uh, think of it equivalently as follows right uh, you see notice that only the variables that are zero currently you know participate in the resampling right so let us here let's do something here right uh, select a set i a random set i uh, i'm sorry set y right each of these indices j each j um, with xj currently 0 goes into y independently with a certain probability, with probability this times this, independently with probability sigma times aij. Okay? So we, we are going to decompose this into, the, into a product of two things. One is this times this and the other is th this times that. So imagine equivalently that uh, if this, if the constraint was still not uh, uh, true, we randomly select a subset of the j's that are currently uh, still zero uh, with uh, independent random choice appropriately, and then we say for j running from for each j in y, for each j in y, for all j in y xj is Bernoulli the same as what you have above, alpha xj, okay? Right? Of course, clearly the two are similar, but this facilitates the analysis, okay? So let's do the following. So uh, a witness tree for this, a typical witness tree would look like the following, right? A witness tree for witness list, a typical witness list for xj equal to 1 will look like this. So let's say it's labeled by J first of all, right? And then it will say because of which constraint this guy became one, right? So suppose it was because of constraint I, right? Let's uh, because of constraint I, then for this constraint I, we may have run multiple iterations, right? In the first iteration, you selected a set Y1, then Y2, and so on. Just list all those, right? So this is the witness list still th this could potentially be infinite but let's say this stops somewhere then notice first of all that j has to be a member of this y class right notice that this thing doesn't say that constraint i got satisfied by this point of time right all it says is that in the kth iteration of inside this loop when you selected yk you did set xj to 1 and therefore of course Beyond that, it, it would always stay at one. But for this iteration itself, you may need to run more, more, more of these. You may need to go to yk plus one, yk plus two, and so on. But xj, this xj doesn't care about those, right? So this is a typical witness list for j, basically. And by the way, if it was, if it directly became one here, then this stuff, of course, is empty, right? So a typical witness list for xj equal to one looks like this. What we need to do is the bound the probability of any one of them and add over all possible witnesses, right? So let's actually see what happens. You know, already, you know, let's just look at witness lists with just one y1, right? It already tells you something. So, you know, with empty witness lists are easy. The probability of seeing that is simply xj times alpha, that you directly at the first step, you are rounded to one. But what is the pro so, so let's take a very concrete thing. So, so let's say j, Say five constraint number five, um, sorry, it's too big. And let's say you, it stops with a set y one equal to say two three eight, right? And that's it, right? What is the probability? What is an upper bound on the probability of seeing this? So let's say j equal to five. Let's say j equal to eight, right? 
So suppose j was 8. What we're saying is, uh, what this witness list says is that um, xj was initially 0, right? And then while processing constraint 5, directly in the first iteration, the set y that was chosen uh, did indeed choose me also. I am j equal to 8. And then furthermore, in this step, I did turn up, turn up to be 1, right? So this is, this is what this says. And we want to bound the probability of such a thing happening, right? So here is something interesting. So, you know, so what are some necessary conditions for this tree to occur, right? So that's interesting. So there are a few, so, so let's call this uh, uh, some z, some set z, right? And sometimes I may refer, refer to this as i. The following are some necessary conditions, some of which are easy to bound the probability of, one of which has a mild subtlety. And what is that? So, so what are some necessary conditions? Um, so, yeah. So, um, yeah. So the, these are some uh, things. So uh, what we want is, so remember, this is the original sampling, and these are called resamplings. So some necessary conditions for this decision list to come up for j equal to 8 are, and these are all independent events, but the third is slightly subtle. So first is, uh, in the first sampling, so xj equal to 1 in the first sampling. And that's easy. So, and that is with probability alpha xj. So that's easy, right? Second, uh, for all j prime in z, in this set z, uh, initially they must all have been 0. In the initial sampling, all of them must have been 0. Uh, xj prime equals 0 after the very first sampling. That also is easy. The probability is simply the product over all j prime and z of 1 minus alpha xj prime. So that's easy. The third is the following. You know, this is slightly subtle, but we can handle it, right? The, the third is that this, that y1, this, the, the, the y that you, the set y that you chose in the very first itera iteration coincided with 2, 3, 8, right? How do we bound the probability of this? We just want an upper bound. Well, all these are independent, so that's good. So this is independent of this and also of the following, which is that z is the set chosen in the first iteration for constraint number i, right? How do we bound this, right? So, um, well, we can say the following. We can reason about something we don't know and then, uh, you know, uh, unreason about it. So, um, so if this happens, right, so we, what we are really saying is this. Let these we don't know. So, at this point of time, right, you did an initial sampling and suppose the values of the n variables are, n Boolean variables are, from v1 through vn, right? These are the values uh, after the first sampling. In general, these are the va values just before you sampled your relevant set y, right? So let v1 through vn be the values of the variables uh, just before choosing y1, right? Choosing y1, right? Then this stuff that we want then the probability of 3 is simply this, right? Is that, uh, you know, those with v1 equal to 1, we don't care about. But those with v1 equal to 0, you know, those which appeared in, uh, you know, so some of them appeared in z and some did not, right? So the probability of 3 is just this, right? It is the probability over all, over all k such that vk equal to 0, and k is in z, so this k ranges over 2, 3, and 8, for example. And all of these guys must have been put into, into, into y, right, or into z here, which happens with probability alpha a i k times the, for the remaining guys, for the remaining, um, 
vk, which denote going to z, times the probability overall k, such that vk equal to 0, but k is not in z, this thing is 1 minus this thing. But how do we reason about this? We don't know, we don't know the values v, right? But <coughs> here is what we can do. We can upper bound this in the following way. The second, the second term, we can upper bound in the following way. Well, <coughs> so, so by the way, first of all, this is redundant, right? You, you know, if k is in z, you know that vk is zero, so you can remove this first of all. So this term is simply the product over these three indices, right? But what do you, what do you do with this? You can say the following. The second step, the second term you want to upper bound the probability of. And here is where we are going to use the fact that this was still unsatisfied. And that's, that's the reason why we got into this iteration in the first step. Let's write this blob as we'll first take um, all the k not in z, right? So let's just take the product of this over all the k not in z. That we know. We don't need to reason about v here of this, but then we have to sort of divide away from this product every, everybody that was, uh, you know, uh, in k, uh, it was not in z but had vk equal to 1, right? So in, if you think about it, that is simply, so you'll take this to the power of minus 1, the sum over all k such that vk equal to 1 of 1 minus sigma aik, right? So you, you took a product of too many terms here and you are dividing out some of them, right? But how do we reason about this? We don't know the, the vector v, right? But now we use the fact that we came into this because this constraint was still violated. And you know, in, in this, in this uh, you know, matrix vector product, it's only these terms that matter, right? Those with vk equal to 0 don't matter, right? So this means, this means really, that the sum over all k, vk equal to 1, um, aik is smaller than vi, right? This really is what, so we don't know the set of all k such that vk equal to 1, but you know that this stuff, you know, the constraint was still, you know, unsatisfied. Therefore, by simple calculus, one can show that this, therefore, is less than or equal to 1 minus sigma to the power of minus vi, okay? So since the aik is add up to at most vi, you know, this, there is a negative here and a negative, so which is good. So you get that this term is upper bounded by this, right? So therefore, this entire blob 3 can be, its probability can be upper bounded, and all of these are independent, so a necessary condition, so, so, so the probability of seeing this small witness list is really the product of, the, is, is bounded by the, pro, pro, the product of this, 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 and this, okay? And, you know, you need much more algebra to, you know, handle multiple width trees, multiple depth lists, and so on, but these are some of the core ideas. You know, it's not that much more complicated, but it is just a lot of calculation, but then stuff can be done, and, but of course, at every, in every iteration, you know, if you had a long list, you really have to, you know, use this Think that you first of all violated the constraint, you still didn't satisfy, and that's that's the reason why you had to choose this new list y1, y2, etc. Right? So by doing all these, by so so therefore the prob the probability of any one of these decision lists is at most this. And like I said, in order to bound the probability of xj being one at the very end of the algorithm, you have to add all these. And if you do the math, you get something like this. Um, so but there is, like I said, there is one bonus waiting here, which is uh, really nice. So, uh, by doing all of these, we get uh, at the end that the probability that xi is 1 is, uh, you know, let me write the term and then point out to you why the L1 norm comes naturally. It is because you put the aij here that the L1 norm of any column comes up naturally. You get something like this. Alpha, alpha xj is the ideal value, right? So alpha xj is the initial value, but of course this keeps increasing later, so you have to pay something. So the payment is the one, one plus the sum over all constraints, sigma times the sum over all constraints i of aij divided by something. So 
you know, some, you know, it's not very important what it is. This stuff can be upper bounded. And then, you know, this, there is a uniform uh, lower bound for the denominator uh, because of this, uh, because of this notation. And once you do that, you know, the denominator becomes the same for all i. You, you add up all this, and you, in the numerator, you get exactly the L1 norm of the jth column, right? And these are the ideas that help you show, for example, therefore, that if you had just one objective function, the expected value of this at the end of the algorithm is at most this d1 times, d1 times uh, alpha times this quantity, and which, to remind you, the final approximation ratio is basically this. Okay. Right? So you can show that the expected value of any one of your linear objectives is small. Right? But here's the really nice thing about these witness lists, which is that you can argue not just about a single variable. You can argue about what about the probability that over some index set, uh, uppercase j, what is the probability that these are all one? Okay, so you can write you can write the same collection of witness trees and so on. And the really nice thing is, this actually breaks up the so so okay. So let's call this some pj. Pj is this upper bound, right? The very nice thing is you can show that this is bounded by the probability, the product of the probabilities of the pj. The structure of the witness trees actually lets you just do this. So it is not just for one index set, uh, it is not just for one index that you get that its probability is at most pj for this upper bound pj, but for any index set, the probability that these variables are simultaneously one is at most this product. And once you have this, you immediately get concentration above the mean. So immediately, then you can handle all these multiple objective functions, right? You can show that the probability that this deviates a certain thing above the mean is just like what the Chernoff bound would give you, right? And then just take the union bound over on this. So in my original work with Tom Layton et al., uh, and in some of my other work, we could handle this, but only for constant r. In other words, the runtime was of the, of the form n to the O of r, but now it's independent, it's polynomial in r. Mainly because of this very nice property you get uh, from these witness lists from the structure of these witness lists that not just can you bound the probability of one variable being one at the end, but simultaneously could you know, by using the same bound, basically. So you can pretend that these xj's are Bernoulli, independent Bernoulli's with probability pj of being one, and then just apply churn off separately for each other. Okay. So this is uh, one family of results. Since I have very little time left, I will just say uh, what the idea behind this is. The, the intuitive idea is the following, right? So suppose you're doing this, right? So what would, you know, how would Moser Tardosh proceed, proceed for this? Well, independently sample initially from each of these assignment constraints. <coughs> and let's say if this, uh, if this is violated, right? Let's say this was, um, if this BI, the target BI was, let's say, um, say 300, and instead it became 350. Uh, let's say, okay, let's say we, we allowed up to 350 violation, but instead it went up to 360, right? So what would Moser Tardosh do? Moser Tardosh will take all these 300, they belong to various rows here, and resample all those 300 or 360 rows. Right? In fact, not just 360, but all the variables in this row, right? But you can reason like the, follow, uh, like the following. Well, um, I expected 300, and I allowed up to 350, but I've gone to 360. So it's really the 10 that are guilty. Right? So of the 360 that are one, why not just sample 10 at random and resample their corresponding row, right? You need to resample far fewer in number, basically. Okay? So, and that, you know, and with, with from a lot, you know, a lot of additional calculation leads to this kind of final result. Okay, so, so I, I will, so, so if I were to give you a very high level way in which you can sort of try and extend Moser Tardosh, it really is this. Like I said, Moser Tardosh, you know, you have a bunch of bad events, right? If this bad event that depends on these variables, you know, let's say these 360 or, uh, variables is currently true, Moser Tardosh will, you know, resample all of them, right? It introduces lots of dependencies. Your, your uh, witness trees become much 
you know, the space of them becomes much bigger and so on. Our idea is for every one of the bad events EI, which depends on some subset SI of your entire set of variables, start with an a priori distribution DI on subsets of SI, right? So it assigns, it's a distribution on subsets of SI. And every time you have to resample for this, select a set randomly from your a priori distribution and only resample it, right? By careful appropriate choices tailored to the application, one can get, uh, you know, different results. So just to summarize, so one gets all of these, but I think the, you know, the message I'd like to sort of, uh, uh, you know, convey really is that uh, Moser Tardosh is uh, really a, a powerful starting point, but by now it's been understood to have, you know, so many different extensions and, you know, variants that I think, um, uh, you know, it's well worth exploring as a, as a random process of its own interest. For whether you should. So the nice thing here is, if you, yeah, well, it, it truncates your, the length of your decision list somewhat. So uh, Neil's question is, you know, is this really necessary or could you have just made this if all the variables zero? If you did that, if all the AIJs were small, for example, it may disadvantage you somewhat. I think a good starting distribution is often a good idea. Yeah, so for example, if you do this, already the number of violated constraints is going to be quite small. I see, if you, if you made this zero, will it only double the runtime or something you're asking? Yeah, that, that may be true, may be true. I'm just a little worried about what if the AIJs are highly distributed in any column, right? There are lots of tiny pieces, right? So for any one row, this guy is quite, I'm just a little worried about that too, I think. I see. So Ravi's question is why not make this alpha uh -huh. So why, why not put that in there? Yeah. yeah you could have, yes. That, that would also work. That's true, yeah, that's true. This thing? Uh -huh. Ah, that's true. Ah, so, so I don't, yeah, I believe the following is not true. I don't think this is true that probability that xj equal to 1, conditional on xj equal to 1. So those are called negative, I mean, that's one simple, consequence of negative association. I don't think these variables are negatively associated. Really 